This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 96, recorded on August 17th, 2010. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and this is TWIV, and today we're continuing with Virology 101. And with me to do that, right across the desk, is Dixon de Palmier. Hey, Vince. How are you doing, Dixon? Doing well. I always say that. Well, I am. Very good. I well, would let you know if I wasn't. These are the episodes you like particularly. I love these because I get to play the role of the real dummy in this case. and <laughs> The uninitiated non-virologist gets to ask all the right, right questions yeah. from an innocent standpoint. Vincent is George, and you're Gracie. <laughs> hey, was, whose voice was so that? I, I, somebody, ah. Wait a minute. That was from North Central Florida. That's Rich Condit. Welcome, Rich. Hi, fellas. Hey, this is your first, your first Virology 101. <laughs> yes, it is. I'm really looking forward to this. Good. Um, this will be a good time. Rich is here because, well, actually, he's joined TWIV since the last Virology 101. Exactly. And he is a DNA guy. Cool. And that is the topic for today. DNA viruses. How viruses with DNA genomes duplicate their genetic information. Huh. It's not as simple as you might think. I've never thought that was simple, ever. Now, the <laughs> Remember, last... I went to school before they knew DNA was the actual genetic material. <laughs> Ooh, yes, it's in fact, true. In fact, I was just going to say, we've done a Virology 101 on RNA synthesis and reverse transcription, and you should go back to those, the listeners, that is, because we talk all about the history of the discovery of nucleic acids, exactly. RNA and DNA, yep. which we don't want to go through again. Nope. Now, we have talked about how viruses with RNA genomes duplicate their genetic information. Right. All of those viruses have to have an enzyme called RNA polymerase that they bring into the cell or encode in their genome because a cell can't copy big RNAs that those viruses have. Right. Okay. Today, the viruses we're going to talk about have DNA, like us. Wow. We have DNA as our genetic material. Huh. And these viruses, many of them tap into our machinery. So you think some of them might have come from us, Vince? Or do you mm. think we derived ourselves Is from that them? Is that the chicken or the egg? It's a philosoph philosophical question that's unanswerable, <laughs> I'm sure. But uh, <laughs> at least I can ask it now, but, but before I couldn't. <laughs> you can. We don't know. Who knows? There are some theories that say viruses came from cells or... Right. I mean, we've been down that road before, first. but now we we've know. got the DNA instead yeah. of just the RNA, right? It's Well, you, at, maybe at the end you'll have some insight, because, and, and you'll have as much as anyone. Right. Because we just don't know. Right. So today we will talk about how viruses with DNA genomes duplicate that material. So what we have today is we have slides, ah. pictures, and words. Excellent. And uh, at some point this will be released as a video, nice. so you can see... That and when the audio comes out, which hopefully will be soon, we'll also provide all the slides. So, in case we don't have the video right away, hmm. as the video takes a while to put together, all right? So, uh, and there in this video, you can see Rich Condit. So, uh, no one has really seen him before. <laughs> so, there he is. And I'm, on the wall behind him are all his kids. Great. It's pretty yep. cool. Very nice. That's really neat. And there's Dixon. You see the camera over there, Dixon? I do see that That's camera. That's Dixon across the desk. This is typically how we sit, unless yeah. I'm mad at you and then I have my back to you. That's right. right. Exactly. And we never see Rich, but in the future, we'd like to do this more. Sure. So Rich is going to go away now, and so are we, because we're going to go to the slides. Right. Or as they used to say, let's go to the videotape. I don't Got know. It. That's probably older than Warner all Warner Wolf used to say that. He did? He did. So we'll do this, and if we have time, we'll do some email. Great. Let's start at the beginning. Now, huh. let's see. How do I get rid of Rich Con? Just, just do slideshow. <laughs> it's easy. Just tell me to go away. I'm out yeah, of here. There he oh, is. Oh, no, no. He's there. He's gone. Please. Oh, you can't get rid of me. <laughs> so, Rich, I'm on the first slide, which is a... Uh, I'm on the first slide, too. Picture oh, double of, Picture of a double-stranded DNA molecule, which everyone probably recognizes. Even little kids. Dixon, who solved that structure? Well, you know, it's it's up for grabs on that one. I think Rosalind Franklin had something to do with it. But I'm glad you said that. Because Watson and Crick are given full credit for it. But they, they through their biographies, admitted that uh, Rosalind played a huge role in all of this just by yes. providing them with insight as to what well, they, this thing looked she like. She had the, the pictures, the x-ray pictures. Looking right down the core of this thing, yes. they could... 
They could see it, but Linus Pauling... Well, we won't go there. And then there was another scientist who actually used to be here at Columbia who played an important role. That's his role. Erwin Chargaff. Exactly. Hey, hey. He had exactly. the base pairs all worked out, but he, he did. didn't know what it meant. He didn't know what it meant structurally, but they used that in solving right. the structure. Right. So here on our screen is a short piece of double-stranded DNA. Now, there are, we take lots of liberties when we talk about this, yeah. and we have to really explain them clearly. It's double-stranded, first of all. So... Let's talk about how this this DNA is made up. So you, I think you can see one strand, the backbone of one strand, curving around in a helical form, and then the second strand. It's pretty obvious. Yep. And it, it we'll see in a moment in a bit more detail. That backbone is made up of sugars and phosphates. And then what holds the two strands together are the bases. Right. They hydrogen bond with one another. Correct. And do you know how to break those bonds, Dixon? I guess it has to end in ace. <laughs> These, no, the bonds between the bases. You could cut it. Yes, you could cut this into short pieces you with DNA. You say which particular yeah, way okay. this is going. I'm, I'm wrong. You're absolutely right. <laughs> so you can, you can pull the two strands apart with heat. If you can put them together with a polymerase, I bet you you can take them apart with yeah. a depolymerase. There are, there are enzymes that pull them apart as well. And as right. you'll see, some of the polymerases do a good job of doing right. or, that. Or you could just heat it up. Yes, yeah, so you could he definitely heat it up. Of course, in our cell, you would have to get very hot to separate these strands, and we don't typically do that. But what an interesting question. Why don't the bacteria who live at the bottom of the ocean, where it's hundreds of degrees, why doesn't their DNA melt? Hmm. This is good trust. Anyway, that's a diversion. Melt. You said melt. So that's the w one of the words we use. When we separate the strands by heating, we call it melting. Indeed. So it's double-stranded. And if you took away one strand, you could replace it because all the information to make that second strand is in the first, and vice versa. And vice versa. Right? Like, so the two uh, Velcro. strands. It's like Velcro. We I call one Velcro. strand and the other is the complement. Right. Now, that may not be so clear, but maybe in the next slide it will be. Let's see what we have here. Ah. ah. Rich, did you want to add anything to that first nope, slide? No, that's okay. I'm waiting for the base pairs here. They're my favorite. <laughs> you like the base pairs? Yeah, when uh, when uh, when I was in this is a digression, but when I was in graduate school, my uh, my boss came back from giving a qualifying exam to some student, and she was uh, she was all miffed because the student didn't even know the structure of the bases, and I'm yep. sitting there thinking, oh, "Ooh, I don't know the structure of the bases." <laughs> so right. I I I tried to write off and memorize them, and in fact, the way I one of the tricks I used to memorize them was to memorize them as base pairs. Indeed. Okay, because uh, they make more sense as base pairs, uh, or it's easier to remember them. Many more. qualifying exams have gone by this. I remember when I was a postdoc with David Baltimore, he came back from an exam complaining that the student didn't know the structure, the chemical structures of the four bases, uh. adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. That's right. So this is a different view of the DNA molecule we just showed. It's uh, a chemical structural view. Yep. You can see the two strands, again— one strand, the backbone of phosphates and sugars, mm -hmm. and the other on the other side. And then in the middle, the two strands are held together by hydrogen bonding between the bases. And yes, it was Erwin Chargaff who said right. the amount of adenine is always equal to the amount of thymine in DNA, and the same as it's guanine. For he why didn't know why. Had, what, a, what an interesting observation, and what a poser, unless you know the structure. That's right. I mean, could you imagine learning that? That yeah. takes a pure chemist to do that, first correct. of all. Right? That's yeah. correct. That's it's not correct. something that I would ever have discovered. And when <laughs> Pauling came up with his proposed structure, he yeah. had three phosphates in the center, and everything else was ah. on the outside. Interesting. And it's just, Even yeah. convincing yourself that they were really equal to each other, you know, because <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that, there had to be a reason for that, correct. right? Correct. Now, let's see. There are a couple of interesting things. So, first of all, this I think you can see how it makes a double strand. And if you heat this... You can separate one strand from the other. And again, right. a strand is a backbone with bases attached. So let's look at the backbone. So we have at the very top left, five prime end, there's a phosphate group, and then a sugar. It's a ribose because it has five carbons. Yes. And then uh, down, another phosphate, another sugar, another phosphate, another sugar, and so on down the line. That's the backbone of DNA. In the other view, this was twisted into a helix, and here it's been flattened out. Right. So if you melt it, and then you cool it. What is the process 